Right, okay, let's let's kick off then. So um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first of hopefully this winter's series of webinars. Now we only launched this 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 time last year, but the five that we've had to date have all been different and have been well received by our members and people who have watched. So can I welcome on behalf of the society, obviously our old friends, our members and people who have seen these webinars before, and also any of our new uh, people who have, um, are joining in for the first time. Um, the difficulties of getting people into the agricultural industry from school and college is becoming an increasing problem. And we in the society are fully aware of all the challenges that brings. And indeed, it, it, the, the whole uh, educational aspect of um, agricultural based activities is something that which we are extremely um, involved in, uh, both in the show itself, for those who know the superb things that have been done in the Discover Farming um, section, the uh, classroom that we have at Washing Pool Farm near Bridport for younger children, and of course, the bursary scheme, which has been so successful over the last um, good many of years, um, in which we as a society have um, donated well over £100,000 um, to a wide variety of bursary students. Um, we think it's probably one of the best schemes of its type that any agricultural society um, can put on. And obviously today um, it's something which we're going to celebrate because one of our panelists is indeed um, an ex-bursary ex student. Uh, the theme tonight then is um, uh, education, agriculture, uh, trends and needs. What we're trying to do is to get our panel to talk about um, what is currently and what has been provided in education specifically related to the agricultural industry and then um, Lucy Milne who I'll introduce in a second is going to talk um, more about as a, as a consumer of education and what perhaps um, she felt could have been done better where there were gaps what was done well to try and actually from a consumer's point of view talk to our providers. Um, we're delighted then to have our panelists. Now I'm going to introduce them in no particular order. Um, Lydia Lee is the uh, Director of Agriculture at Kingston Moorwood. I'm going to ask each of them when they start their little introduction to say a bit more about them. But Lydia is, as I say, the Director of Agriculture at Kingston Moorwood. David Humphreys is the Director of Land and Environmental Studies at the Dorchester Studio School. Um, Andy Dorr will probably be well known to many of you. He was formerly at Kingston Moorwood, um, but he is now an assessor at land-based engineering um, apprentices across the southwest, and he's based at Bicton College. And then finally, um, Lucy Milne is um, part of a well-known West Dorset family, and she is an ex-student at Sirencester, um, and as I said earlier, was a bursary uh, recipient uh, between I think 2013 and 2016. So that's our panelist. We're going panelists, sorry. We're going to follow the same format as we've done before, and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to do a short presentation about uh, their thoughts on the subject. Um, there may well be questions between them. There may be questions from myself, and obviously, if you, as the uh, viewers, want to ask any questions, then just follow the chat button. Um, at the bottom of your screen, ask the question and I'll pick it up and I will pass it on. So hopefully that's all fairly clear. Um, we're going to stick to time. We'll be finished by half past seven. So your second gin and tonic will be available then, but perhaps you might have one as we go along. So assuming that Andy has finished his first gin and tonic, um, can I start with you, Andy? A little introduction and then over to you. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I was at uh, I taught at uh, Kingston Moorwood. I was work, worked at Kingston Moorwood for about twenty one years. Before that, I, I worked at a very small agricultural college in Worcestershire. Uh, I then have spent si I've been at Bicton for six years. Five of those I was head of Bicton. Um, 
I first came across Kingston Morwood, though, uh, when I was uh, about 15, when I was considering what to do after, what I, what I was going to have to do after my O-levels. Yes, that old. So I did O-levels. And the idea was, uh, I, I thought I'd really like to go to Kingston Morwood because I, I, my, um, my father's mother came from a farming family in Solway Ash. So they um, used to spend many summers down at Solway Ash on the farm and thought and, and really always enjoyed being involved with the farm. But I was told really clearly by the by the by Kingston Moor that as I was a grammar school boy, A levels was the route I ought to take and go to go and do you know go to university, which is what I did and study agriculture at, uh, at Newcastle. Uh, I first came across Kingston Moor in the mid eighties uh, uh, when I uh, was able to do some teaching there, covering uh, someone who was uh, who had to take a sabbatical for six months. Um, and it, it was really interesting seeing a college at that time, which was primarily still agriculture. It had one agriculture course, a full-time course. There were 36 students, several hundred apprentices, but only 36 full-time students. And Lydia will tell us shortly how many students she's got in agriculture, which is, I suspect, a lot more than 36 and a lot more within Kingston Moorwood. Uh, and, and that's one of the real changes that's happened is just the size of colleges have had to get bigger. Worcester College of Agriculture had no full-time students even in the 90s and they're no longer. They, they've been, they just totally disappeared. It was taken over by, um, by uh, Pershaw and then disappeared completely. And so there's been, there is a pressure on colleges to be successful in a number of different ways. And obviously size is one of them and having enough students. One of the great delights though about being involved with land-based colleges is that you end up teaching fathers the, the sons of fathers that you taught before which is really nice and um you, or you got or there's lots of family connections or lots of connections around life and work because they're just wonderful uh focus points for for land-based and agriculture and rural life uh at bicton just when i when i was there uh, a couple of years after i'd taken over as head of head of bicton I met a lovely lady who was a bit older than me, but her mum and dad had met on the first, on the second agriculture course at Bicton. Uh, the father was uh, was studying agriculture and Bicton had taken this, the swift move of putting in, in place essentially a farmer's wife course. So it was it was all about home economics. It was all about keeping small animals. Uh, and and, and the, the, the mother of this lady uh, had attended that course. And that's because both Kingston Ward and Bicton were set up after the Second World War. There was a white paper at the end of the, it, it, through the Second World War that asked county councils to set up agriculture colleges because we needed food, we needed training for farmers, uh, people leaving, the, uh, coming back after the war needed to be trained to, 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 re, to redirect their lives as, 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 as uh, Great Britain tried to sort itself out after the Second World War. Um, and in many senses, the colleges didn't really change for long periods of time. And, and, and the, the, the course, I suspect, in the 1980s was not that dissimilar from the course in the, uh, in the 1950s. It was a full, broad agriculture course. And we talk about courses being how long they are in terms of hours. So I suspect there was something, as I remember, there was something like 1,200 hours of teaching, both practical uh, and theory in a full-time course. I can see Lydia smiling there because wouldn't it be nice, Lydia, to have 1,200 1, 1, hours of teaching to teach somebody? Uh, and I suspect to teach someone well in agriculture, you probably do, and to offer the, the breadth of training that's required for, for a modern farmer or a modern rural worker or a modern, modern countryside worker, you need that sort of a number of hours to be able to really offer but they're not available now in the current way that colleges have to work. A couple of key changes that happened uh, uh, for colleges in 1993, so quite a long time ago, um, county councils were stripped there of their responsibility for, for, um, uh, for, for, land, for agriculture colleges, and, and it went to a national government and department for education. And there's been various bits and pieces and various experiments uh, the government have tried around who controls 
both the curriculum and the funding for colleges. But all the time, land-based colleges are not special. They're just part of the further education colleges. So the funding that Kingston Ward or Bicton receives is exactly the same as the funding that Weymouth College or Exeter College receives. There is a recognition that agriculture courses cost more to run, and so that there's a balance in there. Right now, 16 to 19, if, if, if you take away any, anything from this, from this meeting this evening, this chat this evening, if you've got young people, if you're, if you've, if you're responsible for and can influence young people, post 16, there is a period, in, in, not in higher education, but in further education, where you can get funding for education for free from 16, 17, 18, and a bit into 19. There's three years of training. And, and that's free. After that, it begins to cost more money, depending on what's going on. There's a little bit more money of free training available now. But on the whole, in the last few years, there's been very little free training available. So take that advantage if you, if, if you can influence someone uh, post-16 for the next three years. Um, interestingly, uh, some, some people know we've done a lot of work at Kingston Ward. We did a lot of work at Kingston Ward with uh, colleges in Austria. And colleges in Austria, uh, the college that we visit, is controlled by local government, national government, and the equivalent of DEFRA. So they sit in, they have people in the agriculture ministries influencing what we're being taught. That's not the case in the UK at all. As DEFRA have no responsibility or no input really into colleges, and it, which is always a big surprise to me because you'd think the people who are funding and supporting farming would, would want to be involved in, in, in the influencing training for young people, but they're not. The other thing that's changed, one of the other things that's really changed dramatically in the last few years is Ofsted and, and, and the judgment about of what quality is. Certainly in the, 19, um, in the 1980s and 1990s, quality was about how, how much you knew about the pig industry if you were the pig tutor how much you knew about crops, if you could run plant, if you could run crop trials. That was the sort of the nature of, of, of quality. Whereas now the quality is about how effective you are as teaching, how good you are at engaging people in, in, in classrooms, how good you are at people getting through qualifications. All the time, I think, in my, in my time of all the changes that have gone on in education, there's been a real balance all the time between vocational training and academic training and they sort of at various times various governments have different views um, but generally speaking schools GCSEs A-levels have much more sway over government thinking than the sort of work that's carried out in vocational land-based agricultural colleges I think mainly because not necessarily the, the the MPs but anyone who works within the Department for Education hardly any of them have ever come across a college of further education and hardly any of them, in fact, I suspect hardly, almost none, have come across a land-based college or an agricultural college. So it's a sort of, uh, sadly, it's a pretty, um, a, a, well, a pretty poorly, uh, it's a poor secret, and, and, and it, doesn't, it, it doesn't do us any, it doesn't really uh, do us any good. Uh, one other more key change is in 2000, and this is one which is really important for, which sort of directs the change that goes on in colleges. In 2017, the government decided that colleges of further education, including Kingston Ward and Picton, could go bust. So there is no special place in the in, in, in Department for Education for colleges. If they get it wrong, the governors and the senior management team, the principal, if they get it wrong, then the colleges go bust. That's it. They go bust. There's no sort of safety net, which changes people's attitudes about what you can and can't do. It changes your mind about how much money you'll invest in the farm. When farming's been really good, you can invest in farming. But if farming isn't making much money at the time, it can be a real problem. And there's always this balance in colleges about what type of farm should we have? How, what's the involvement of students? How do students learn? How do people get in, you know, how do people learn about how to castrate a, a calf? How many calves have you got to have? How many times should they practice? And all those things really sort of really impact upon the actual delivery. Other changes that really are affecting colleges right now, I think, are things like, and, and probably rightfully so, if you haven't got the equivalent of a pass in GCSE in maths and English, and you go to Kingston Ward or Bicton, you have to carry on studying maths and English all the way through. And that can be a real, a real tricky 
direct barrier to someone who is wonderful and exceptional practically, but cannot get maths GCSE or English GCSE at a grade four as it is now. And that really can stop people progressing uh, further up the track and, and, and going on to university after that, even though they may, uh, and further study, even though they may have really, really good skills and excellent understanding about agriculture. All colleges are different. They take advantages of the fact that of the, what they were gifted by the county councils back in the, 19, uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, what they were given, they've taken advantage of. So Kingston Wood were able to take advantage of their wonderful house and their wonderful gardens to, and to, to control a lot of visitor attractions. But that came about because of the real focus upon the growth and what, how you want to involve uh, staff and students uh, Bicton took a different route. They've spent a lot more money on having accommodation. So unlike Kingston Ward, there's a, there's a 250 bed a complex uh, at, at, at Bicton. Going forward, uh, other people will touch on going forward, but a, for a college to be successful, you still have to recruit students. Ofsted comes into that. You still have to recruit staff. Decent salaries come into that. Workloads come into that. And right now, I, where, when I started teaching, part-time teaching was a, good, was a good option. It was well paid. But right now, compared to salaries that you can get in straightforward farming, teaching is, a, is, not, as well, is not as well paid. It's not that competitive in terms of in the jobs market. And I'm sure Lydia, like myself, has always been struggling to find good staff on the wages that we can pay. I think... That gives a flavour, Nigel, of, of where the colleges have come know. from. Andy, I think that's been a fantastic overview of how we've got there. Um, my father went to Kingston Ward in, in the 1950s, so I'm glad that what he was taught then or not taught was still being taught as far as, you know, as close to my generation as the 1980s. Um, before I go on to Lydia, there's one question that's already come up, which is um, the person's got to go out. So... Um, they want me to ask it now. Um, and that, Andy, actually relates to something you just said. And, and they say, how important is a farm to a land-based college? Having a farm, I'm assuming, to a land-based college. Yeah, there is, um, there's one college uh, over in the southeast which doesn't have a farm. They sold it because uh, they, they, you know, they, they reached that point where they didn't have enough money and they had to sell it or they were controlled by another college. Um, and when I was working at, uh, at Bicton College, which is one college in nine colleges as part of Cornwall College, there's always, there was always a fight about whether you should have this expensive thing or this thing that's quite valuable. You'd, you'd understand that, Nigel, in terms of an mm -hmm. asset that you could release and actually spend a lot of money on classrooms if you uh, sold a bit of the farm or changed the size of the dairy herd. And of course, if you're putting up a new dairy, you need, you know, you're paying it back over 25 years. Well, that's quite a long time in the, in the life history of a, of, a, of a college. To my mind, farms are absolutely essential because they give access to, and most farms don't want lots of small children or kids or young people traipsing all over them. And so you have to set your farm up in such a way that you can let people look in. You've got to have farm staff that don't mind people looking over your shoulder saying that's not the way my dad does it or my wife or my mum does it. You know, you need what you need to be able to demonstrate and show however imperfectly that can sometimes seem in a particular way. So what you want is that farm to be good at the farming system it chooses to do. And that's why, Everybody. interestingly, Lots of people have chosen to work with external, external people like Velcor, other farming uh, enterprises, which can bring another expertise to support the teaching staff who are having to concentrate on the Ofsted and the fact they're teaching a lot more students than they used to. Thank you, Andy. That's really helpful. So um, we have covered how we got to where we are. So can I introduce Lydia, who's going to explain exactly who she is, and she's going to talk about exactly where we are now at Kingston Ward. Uh, thank you, Nigel. Um, there are some slides um, that I sent to Lucy that may or may not be shown, but I will carry on regardless. Um, so I started teaching at the college 10 years ago, and then eight years prior to that, I was a student here. Um, I actually did the countryside apprenticeship 
um, all those years ago, uh, all those years ago, and that's how I first found out that FE colleges existed. I had already done A levels and university, um, and wasn't happy. Wanted to be in a land based career, and had no idea that. Um, FE colleges existed and had the best time training to do my, my countryside apprenticeship um, and since um, sort of completing that I've done sort of a number of roles in land-based industries um, and spent the last five years doing some part-time work in um, arable trials which I found um, really interesting and again something that I never knew was an option um, growing up so I feel very passionately about informing young people and also re reassuring them that no matter what their experience so far um, they can be educated um, they you know it can be a, and it can be a really successful and varied career path that they can enter um, I know a number of people that have done all sorts of jobs in industry and continue to develop their careers in different ways um, and I try and get the students to meet as many of them as possible so they can see um, sort of all the different options that there may be and that they're not at no point are they often fixed on one path just because they've made a few decisions. Um, I'd, uh, I'll just go through some facts that came up in um, what Andy said. Yeah, we now have over 100 students um, in agriculture, so um, a few more than have they been historically. Um, and about only about 20 apprentices at the moment though. But again, the way that apprenticeships are managed is different. So it's gone up to um, at least a year and a half to be on an apprenticeship program. So again, that kind of, uh, that sort of changes um, how many and the sort of turnover of apprentices at farms. Um, so it's maybe slightly fewer apprentices, but um, a lot more full-time students coming onto the courses. Um, Lucy, shall I proceed without slides? Yes, yeah. we're all good with slides. So yeah, if you just want to let me know when you want me to display one, but they're all queued up ready. Okay, well, we could go, we could, we could do some slides. It might, it may help, it may not. Um, I do if you could show slide two, or if you could start from slide two. Um, so I put together some slides because um, um, I quite like seeing things visually and then hopefully this will um, clarify some of the things that we do. So um, what was the uh, the college as it was the Dorset Farm Institute is now Kingston Moorwood College and these this is the breadth of courses that we now offer. So agriculture is a core part of um, the provision here which I'll talk more about but you'll see that it's now supplemented by courses um, sort of across land-based industries but also other types of industry that fall within further education um, and that there is a local need to deliver courses for. Um, this um, range of courses will continue to evolve depending on um, the needs and the feedback from local industry um, but agriculture with um, sort of a quarter of the students um, almost a quarter of the students uh, accounted for in that department is going to remain um, really important to us. Um, as well as delivering the technical skills, and as Andy referred to, you know, that um, uh, importance of being proficient in your um, specialism, we also have um, a, a large job to do in terms of helping young people with their personal skills. So, um, part of our week and, and part of our lessons is around building um, confidence and communication and uh, their sort of employability skills alongside them technically being able to operate a tractor, um, put up a fence in a straight line. Um, so we have to uh, we have to include lots of different things within our college week um, to support young people to become employable. Um, a lot of young people don't have maybe the contact with um, work that they might have done historically. A, a number of them come to us. They've never done any sort of part time job, weekend job. And we also have um, more than half of our students from um, not from farming backgrounds or not directly from farming backgrounds. So um, we, it's a, a real, a really broad skill set we're putting on top of their technical knowledge. Um, we won't do all the slides, Lucy. I'll skip through some of the information. Um, what I do keep an eye on are the local jobs. So I'm acutely aware of the um, shortage of skilled workers that um, is affecting Dorset, but also there's the picture nationally. Um, and 
that's really useful for me because I can reassure students that there's going to be jobs for them. I can show them the types of job advert that are coming out. Um, I keep student, we keep students up to date with what jobs are available. So we can say to them, look, this, these are the actual jobs that people um, you know, want employees for. You may have um, an idea of the type of job you want to do, but you need to understand what is required by industry um, and what those jobs might be day in, day out. And we talk about those job roles um, before students come to us, um, as well as, um, as well as, thank you, Lucy, um, as well as, um, uh, as they go through their courses and we're constantly updating them and showing them um, sort of real-time job adverts and also trying to help them access those job adverts independently and guide themselves as to what, um, what their skill set looks like and, and what they need to do to make themselves more employable. Um, we're also aware, so this sort of links to this slide and another slide that Lucy might show, um, we're sort of acutely aware that the farmed landscape still accounts for nearly three quarters of um, the area of Dorset. And that also, that's the national picture, um, that farming is, um, is, has the responsib uh, responsibility for those natural resources. Um, and that is sort of hot on the government's agenda at the moment is how we manage natural resources and how we appreciate the services they provide us um, from food to climate regulation to um, uh, materials. Um, and we try and explain that to our students that, um, you know, three, that it's a fact that three quarters of the, you know, th um, three quarters of the landscape is farmed. Um, that is a huge responsibility on the farming community, but also um, a huge opportunity um, for linking up with other industries, um, for feeding back to government about what possibilities there might be, um, and showing, and showing uh, students all the links with different land management organisations um, and how important it is that they understand that bigger picture um, and why the government has so much interest in um, the work that they're doing uh, and why there's so much regulation as well that um, they have to now know. Um, so as Andy pointed out, the college farm is a really important part of our provision here. And um, what they're having the farm on site allows is for students to do the routine jobs um, easily and effectively. And they can also have a varied day. So um, they can go and feed the calves, then they can go fencing, and then they can do a theory, a theory lesson on plant science, all in one day at college. And we find that a mixing practical and theory can really help them to remember information and understand how um, that links together, how what they're learning in the classroom is actually useful for what they're doing on farm so uh, we find having the farm here invaluable students are out every day but not just from agriculture courses from um, animal science courses and countryside courses from outdoor pursuits courses and horticulture um, that the farm is in constant use um, and we um, you know we are really um, glad to have the studio school using the resources as well and it's really interesting to see different types of projects that they start and follow up on our site um, and we can reflect ourselves about how we manage our own projects and that's a really fantastic partnership. Um, so at the moment the College Farm um, has a 150 cow dairy, um, 400 um, clean ewes um, that uh, are um, necessary for us to maintain some of our areas at the college, which are um, have to, are permanent path, permanent pastures. So we've got water meadows and historic parkland, um, and it's really important that we have um, that the sheep work really well here for those areas. And we have a small block of arable which is leased, um, but that works well. It's enough for us to um, let students do field work but we will also take them out to farms where they've got um sort of more extensive systems and maybe wider rotations so we do as much as we can with the college farm and the students are on the college farm every day um but we always supplement that with looking at other enterprises and going out to other types of farm um but as uh, andy indicated by having the, the farm here we can let the students learn how to use a cultivator and that can take them all day because there's no pressure to get a field cultivated, an area is set aside um, 
uh, weather, you know, only only a few times is the weather really pressing. Um, and we can give the time the students need to learn how to use that equipment properly. Um, and yeah, and, and you know, hopefully any of you that have already had, you know, got um, no students that have come to the college, they will talk about that, how much they use in the college farm all the time. Um, so to clarify, just one more time to reiterate that um, what the college offers is, an, is usually an alternative to A-levels. So at Kingston Moorwood, we're taking students who are, are 16 or above. And sometimes that is, um, we have adults retraining, um, but we have a large number of students, um, you know, between 16 and um, 19. Um, and they come on to um, our full-time courses or our apprenticeships. Um, I hope you don't mind my very complicated diagram, um, but for some people, particularly those that have maybe got um, young people on courses or know people who um, are on these courses or are um, have been, um, someone's asked them about an apprenticeship, this might help. Um, so when students come to us, the course they go on to is now based on academic ability. So we are required to take students academic ability at that point and then um, progress them from there. So uh, this means that in a classroom, we can have students with a lot of different um, practical ability and understanding of the industry, um, but they'll be of a similar academic level. And that actually works really well because for the courses, there's a, a real broad skill set that's required. And just because someone has never been in a dairy parlour doesn't mean that they might not know an awful lot more about um, some of the opportunities to manage crops differently because they've um, sort of done other things um, with their, um, got other experience. So the you come in, depending on your GCSEs usually or other qualifications um, and then once you're onto a course um, it is you the level one and level two courses are one year the level three program is a two-year program and you can progress through those levels um, depending on how you achieve and also what where you want to go at the end of it a number of our students come out of courses at different levels to go into employment um, a lot of students access jobs through their work placements or through a contact of their work placements um, or they feel that they've um, got enough you know sufficient skills um, to move into industry um, from from college we we often though get students students come through our level three program which is quite comprehensive and it also includes um, sort of additional training um, and then and often it's from level three that students will move out into paid employment. Some of our students go on to university. Um, at the moment, it is a minority. I think that will be it'll be interesting to see how that changes because there's lots of different options after what's currently the level three or the A level equivalent. There are foundation degrees, level four apprenticeships, um, different uh, organizations and industry industry doing their own training schemes how education can continue after college um is continue is still evolving so i keep my eye on that to try and make sure i'm directing students um the right way so all of our courses include um an element of machinery and tractor driving um as a core but also other machinery um every Every course include, includes crops, every course includes um, livestock husbandry, um, and every course has to do something around um, understanding the agricultural industry and agricultural businesses. Um, and the, the way those units are managed does depend on the level, um, but they all include all of these topics. And maybe later Andy might have the time to comment on how different this was, um, how, how, the, how much this has changed. Um, but all of the courses are quite broad um, or as broad as we can um, be with our curriculum. And um, what we're trying to do is make the students as employable as possible. And particularly we are focused on skills they would need to enter farms in the southwest so that's what we're geared to do, towards but some of these um, topics students will be covering um, in any part of the country they'll be covering them so this is a typical timetable I thought might be of interest to you so students do three days a week um, 
those uh, are with a variety of lessons, as you can see. So we try and leave enough time to do practical lessons. Um, and that will, that's always sort of on a rotor. So one half will do one thing one week. Sometimes they'll be able to swap depending on what they're doing in the practical session. Um, every group is now um, has at some point in their course goes and does milking in the parlor um, because we know um, how many farms are need, in need of people um, milking at the moment so we're making sure that's part of every uh, there's um, students get that opportunity at least once well sorry at least every student should have a go at least three times um, in the in the first term so we've got this rotor going so all courses can access the parlor um, so yeah a good range of subjects um, a good uh, sort of some variety um, and they're in sort of different places around campus and you'll notice from this timetable and so again referring back to something Andy said um, is that they're seeing lots of different staff. So all those initials are actually refer to different staff. Um, so I'm really, really lucky that we've started this year with some excellent staff um, with a real breadth of experience. And the students are seeing um, specialists in their subject for um, throughout their timetable. So they see lots of different staff, staff who are able to give them lots of different information. Um, and that's been really well received and um, we're seeing some really um, positive feedback um, and also some really exceptional pieces of coursework from these students because they're being supported but by, by such interesting people that have come from industry. Um, I don't, I don't, only... I, Lydia, I'm not uh, wishing to cut you short but I'm, it's amazing how time is running on with us so um, if you could sort of summarise and then I can get on to David and Lucy that would be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely fine, Nigel. Um, so yeah, just to um, sort of clarify that um, some of what we teach at the college, we have to teach. Um, it's um, sort of mandatory. Um, and then some, but what we can do is flex some things to apply to like, local context um, and pick out local case studies. Um, so we're really, um, we really like you know, any farms um, or employers or any land-based industries that want to engage with us and invite us out for talks, visits or offer work placements. Um, we'd be really keen for anyone who wants to engage with us um, so we can keep tailoring our sessions and the curriculum to um, make most of um, what's available locally and, and um, fulfil what's needed um, for sort of local needs. Um, that's most the most important things, Nigel, if you wanted to move around and we can sort of cover some other things later. Yeah, so that's my just uh, my pitch to try and encourage um, people to just stay in touch with us um, as much as they can. Well, that's Lydia, that's fabulous. That's a really there's some things there I couldn't believe you that the, some, the breadth of courses that you offer. And I've got a number of questions that have come in. But before we go on to that, um, can we go back then or start with probably something that no, well, not that many people know a hidden gem um, in David's uh, Dorset Studio School. So, David, um, a little bit about you and then a lot about the Studio School. OK, yep. Yeah. So um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for the, for the two speakers before me. Um, yeah, I've been... Um, at, at, before I went, joined the Studio School, I was at King's Moor College for 25 years. Um, I was My last job there was assistant principal. Um, for curriculum and quality. Part of that role was ensuring the footfall came across the, the threshold and the, the college um, remained viable, as Andy stated. That is key to successful business. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, the, the, the education establishment is a business. However, it's, it's fun as well, because um, what you're actually doing is able to be um, manoeuvring to suit the needs of the industry. Um, all industries have a, a set skills council, but being a small college, the beauty about um, Kingston Ward is it's small and it can manoeuvre quite quickly, quite fleet of foot. And equally, the studio school follows in that in that um, in that mould too. So one of my last jobs as an assistant principal at, at, at the, the Kingston Ward was um, to respond to government change. A couple of things have happened. Funding had dried up on um transport for link courses uh, from schools. There used to be a, a, quite a, a buoyant market with day release from Key Stage 4 schools, from the county schools, secondary schools. Um, so that was drying up with no money. And also the government had ripped up some of the, well, most of the vocational qualifications <laughs> that schools use for their league tables. They didn't see they were worth as much as um, was being claimed by ward bodies. So it's back to the drawing board. Um, 
and at the same time, probably early early twenties, um, noughties, um, the government were also giving colleges uh, freedoms and flexibilities to perhaps run school schools um, per se. So one of my last jobs was to find a school um, and establish it on the Kingston Ward Estate. Looked at lots of different options. There were university technical college academies, free schools and studio schools. Studio schools by far mirrored um, and sort of underpinned what Kingston Ward is about. It did so because a studio school, number one, why the hell is it called studio school? Um, and when we first opened the studio school, I used to get phone calls about um, little Annie wanted to join, sorry to be so uh, it's typical, but someone wanted to join our, our ballet school or the art studio. And actually the term studio school comes from working in the studios alongside the master. So our studio is our farm, um, land base, and our masters are the farmers and the allied industries that serves the sector. Um, however, studio school was a, 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 a a brand. Um, it was produced by a uh, studio school trust who are no more. But that brand meant that you could, as a secondary school, um, you had to run a national curriculum with a core subject, so it's English, Math, Science, Geography, um, and, and so on. But what you could do is substitute some of the second sort of tier subjects um, with technical qualifications, vocational qualifications. Um, so we, we don't, we, we didn't used to um, teach art, drama, um, history, modern foreign languages. So they weren't in Key Stage 4 and they're still not. We instead teach uh, vocational qualifications in a BTEC animal care, which covers all um, species of animals, including large animals, horses, reptiles and small mammals. Um, the City and Gills. Uh, technical qualification, technical award in land-based studies. That is the agric course, if you like, the land course. So land use and uh, different different industries working in the sector, along with plant science, animal science, and technology. It's a really modern qualification, reflecting future needs of the industry. It's just probably four years old now. So um, a really significant unit on technology used in our in our business. And the other um, parts of the curriculum is, is very much um, heavily um, involved with employer engagement. So lots of work with employers, both as work experience, that's probably what people jump on straight away, but no, it's getting employers to teach and mentor um, our, our, um, our students. Um, move on to that slide in a minute, if you hold it there, Lucy, just before we go on to that slide. Um, I've got a question, I've got a question, a burning question from somebody. In fact, two or three people have asked the same thing. David, mm -hmm. um, they've asked immediately, and they're interested in what you're saying, is mm -hmm. what age group are you actually, your courses are designed for? Yeah, um, and that side will reflect our change. So again, reading the landscape um, and looking at people's appetite for this type of education, because it is a first class education. The last bit with the model was the project based learning element. So it's synoptic learning. It's actually stirring a whole pot up of learning core subjects with the vocational subjects which add not only as a catalyst for inspirational learning but also it um it gives a, an applied context so those kids there have done their maths okay they've worked out what area what shape and planned and used their communication skills designed a brief or responded to a brief and now that's the change in our curriculum we're now delivering from Key stage three, not key stage four. We changed two years ago. So we start at um, year seven, and they are year seven is last year, bless them, uh, conducting a project, carrying out projects in Charminster, the conservation area, where um, we wanted to uh, create a new um, ecosystem. So um, that's, that's part of what they do. So they're learning lots of different learning from that, not least team, um, team building as well and communication. The other part of the key stage three curriculum, so that's years seven, eight and nine, is the forest school curriculum. So forest school isn't learning really about chopping down wood and how you do coppicing. It's more about using that environment to develop um, personal development skills. So it's communication, it's health and safety, it's teamwork, it's resilience, it's respect, 
it's all those core values that seem to you know drift in today's modern society so it's actually allowing kids to play and learn from their play area um moving on to key stage four um we then start uh, looking at the project-based learning projects in earnest so this is the um Oh, this is still key stage three, actually. We moved it down from key stage four. That's making apple juice. So we use the apples from the orchard, kick some more wood, pick them, do a little bit of apple maths along the way. So we work out how many apples you need to actually press to make a litre of apple juice. And then we sort of cost it up. But you can see there, apples being picked at source, collected, taken up to the school, and uh, pressing going on. And we actually pasteurised. And this weekend, we'll be selling the bottles at the um the the doors at winter fair in in um in dorchester um questions come in david on that for the, that somebody said for us who are um uh, not knowledgeable about year um numbers etc in pure ages what are the ages that you start at start at 11 years old so we're now a secondary school 11 to 16 is our age group so we go from 7 8 9 10 11 the five years of secondary school key stage three is um is seven, eight, and nine, and key stage four is ten and eleven. So some amazing projects using Kingston Water State. We really need that estate um, because it, it also, as well as presenting all these opportunities for learning, it also allows role modelling. Um, so our students will see the Kingston Water students, and they aspire to be to be those a big grown up, hairy agriculturalists driving tractors. And this is key stage. Um, Four, and this focuses on uh, the bottom slide, lovely slide, that's looking at uh, students, um, looking at ca catchment sensitive farming, looking at the um, cover crop, which is sopping up all the nitrates, save it going in our water course and polluting our water. The sheep um, handling there is, again, doing some basic skills, some, some sensible skills, not overlapping with King Small, very conscious of that, but just, just inspiring enough to save a bit for tomorrow um, when they go to Kingston Ward. We again, um, six week rotor. So once every six weeks, our student will go on the dairy for an afternoon. Um, and industry visits, uh, bottom left is looking at visits to smarts, looking at the technology used in the land based sector, supporting our curriculum. And at the top left, you've got um, a student working on his work experience placements in year 11 every Friday. They go and um, find an external placement, which again leads them into their career um, career pathway. My job is to fire them out of the school into a positive career progression pathway, and that's often, um, obviously, more often than not, means talking to Lydia and the team, seeing which area they're going to go in the land-based sector. Um, so it's it's very much joined up thinking all the way round. Um, and an extremely strong and successful curriculum. Um, the school is extremely successful at the moment. We are, we are running waiting lists in, in um, most year groups um, and um, the DfE love us because they can see we are fulfilling a need um, in this style of education. So we're looking now to expand the school, looking at um, feasibility options there in terms of expand, extensions or new build. At the moment, we're offering it out of, out of Panbury for our upper school and the college for key stage three. No, it's, it's absolutely um, ref refreshing. Nigel, you've gone, you've gone mute, Nigel. M Nigel, you're muted. Sorry about that, I <laughs> disappeared. Stop the dog barking. <laughs> you know I'm doing this from home. Um, so what I was saying that uh, we have to rush on. I can't believe how time is running on. Um, so we've heard fantastic um, commentary on the past and the present, both at the college and at the studio school and what's being offered from um, age 11 onwards. So what we want to do now is to flip the focus and talk about and get um, Lucy Milne to talk to us about um, her experiences as a consumer, as it were, of the educational offering, not at Kingston Ward or the Studio School, but at Siren Sester, but generally speaking, and her experiences as to um, how she feels things were presented to her. So, um, Lucy, over to you. A little bit of back, back to you would be helpful and what you're doing now and 
how the bursary perhaps helped you and um, any thoughts you have on educational provision? Thank you, Nigel. Um, so I started at Cole Fox um, in Bridport, moved to Hardy's for sixth form. So I took the sort of academic route down those um, subjects, kept my sixth form options quite open, um, which allowed me to go to university following a gap year. Um, I stuck with straight agriculture at Siren Sester, which covered, similar to what Lydia does, every aspect from livestock, crops, um, mechanisation, even sort of going down the organic and different subjects such as wine. Um, so I kept my options very open with that. Some of my friends chose to specialise, which you could go down sort of a crop route, looking further at um, crop production and crop science, sort of more towards the agronomy route. Um, or you could then specialise down the livestock route, which very much took you to sort of more livestock science. Um, I kept my options open by sort of doing a bit of everything. And I think that was vastly beneficial for me. Um, between my group of friends, I think there's six of us, we all did the same course, same topics. Uh, there's myself, I work for Bartholomew's um, in the seed department. So I look at anything that's a forage crop uh, and sometimes go into the cereal side as well. Um, I've got friends that ended up in marketing uh, farm manager, I've got an agronomist, TB tester, uh, and a, a calf rearer. So we've all done very different things, but starting off at the same starting point. Um, our course was brilliant. And for me, the turning point of that was my placement year. Um, so we spent six months in industry. It was entirely our choice where we wanted to go. Uh, I ended up working for Cotswold Seeds um, which is where I ended up, um, where I am now with seeds, started my interest off. And that I think was so useful because you got an insight into uh, an industry, how you could progress your career following on from university and getting that taste of if you liked it or not really um, for me. As we're on Zoom tonight, I think that there's further um, scope for universities to use technology such as this. It wasn't there when I was at university, but to have speakers from different farming ent entities or even international speakers, um, because I think there's so much more rather than just your conventional farming such as arable or livestock. Um, I've certainly learned a lot about fresh produce over the last two years. Um, my boyfriend's in, in lettuce, so that's something that would never have come up at university, but is a fantastic opportunity and completely different. You still have to have the basic knowledge, sort of looking after your soils and things like that, but it's a more diverse topic. And I think sometimes um, there's the lack in university or colleges to look at other things like that. Um, that's what I found. Um, and I think that having an the opportunities um, in the university looking at topics that are so diverse, I think that's um, for me a really important aspect. Um, the other thing I think that universities need to work on is getting more people from non-farming backgrounds interested. Um, one of my colleagues at work, he started off as an apprentice. Um, so he came from sixth form, again, down the academic route, similar to me and decided to do an apprenticeship. Um, I think he did it in business, but he works on our grain desk now. So he's gone from absolutely no farming background at all to working on a grain desk, doing feeds um, for our feed department and also learning about grain trading. Again, something that you perhaps might not cover at university or college, but he's learned that through an apprenticeship. He's learned a skill and he's now fantastic and colleague and employee for our company. Um, question, a question Lucy's come in for you, um, yeah. specifically for you. Um, what do you think are the challenges to a, trying to attract um, students into the agricultural sphere? I think, like I said, trying to get more people from non-farming backgrounds, there's always that sort of stigma perhaps that you don't have the practical knowledge or that sort of practical experience. Um, 
but I think trying to get people certainly involved in colleges where you are lucky enough to have farms and can get out and use those skills. Um, I think that's certainly a challenge. And I think perhaps looking down academic routes, i.e. business, marketing, they're all aspects that farms need, but not necessarily covered um, a standard practice, I think. Um, as we are sort of on more modern technology, social media, I think, is also brilliant side of things. You can show far more of what's going on on a farm day to day by simply sort of, you know, streaming live on Instagram, Facebook. You can attract a wider range of people um, to see what actually goes on in a farm rather than necessarily the bad side of things. Um, I think those for me are the main challenges. Uh, also being a female, um, I get to go very luckily to lots of different meetings, courses, and females are still the minority um, in that industry. My age group, I think are starting to see a lot more people coming through, but anything sort of I've been to recently, it's very much male dominated. And I think we need to try and encourage more females to come through and um, work from there, really. As time is rapidly, I can't believe rapidly, um, um, leaving us for this hour. There's a question that's coming, which is relevant, I think, to all of you. So any of you, please chip in. Um, is an apprenticeship better than a college course? Um, well, I'm happy to start with that. I know Andy probably knows a lot, a lot about this as well. Um, they are different. So if you want to be at work most of the time, um, uh, you you should be on an apprenticeship and that's what an apprenticeship offers it offers a proper balance um, of work and education um, however um, uh, being on a full-time course allows you three days in the classroom to maybe go into topics in a more detail than you may have opportunity to on an apprenticeship program um, and gives you uh, access to some of more of the um, sort of theory behind um, the things you're learning um, and look more, in more detail at business management, diversification and the science. Um, so I think it depends on your individual situation, but and your employability is strong both ways. We have um, you do a slightly le a fewer hours doing work placement if you're on a one of our full time college courses. Um, but we see really strong employment and strong relationships with employers on both programmes. Um, well, I won't ask for any other comments because that's such a, a comprehensive response. Another question to everybody. Um, what are, what, how do we encourage our young teenage, teenagers to consider agriculture as a career? And are there any prospects for a GCSE in agriculture in Dorset? I think it's worth pointing out the, co the courses that the studio school do are equivalent to GCSEs in terms of they're not called GCSEs, but they're, they're equivalent to. Um, and, and they're available to all schools. It's, it's having the confidence to be able to run them. Um, there, are, there is some work going on about a GCSE in rural, in rural studies, but it's, 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 it's a slow pro progress. I, th I think Lucy's point about social media and, and allowing people to understand about what farming is all about is one, of, is one of the key ways of getting things forward. Because there's less people on farms, there's less farm workers, there's less farming families, there's less naturally people going into the farming. So somehow you've got to get it out to everybody as has been indicated. And I think the reality is it is social media. It's finding ways. It's finding more people who have been converted like Jeremy Clarkson. Um, a completely different question from a different um, angle, but obviously highly relevant to some of our um, viewers. Um, what is expected of employers who offer work experience? Anybody going to pick that one up? Um, well, do you want to go? Sorry, do you want to go first, David? Um, with yes, uh, if you don't mind, uh, because our, our curriculum is uh, certainly uh, year eleven is is very much. We've got about three hundred ex employers on our books. We're currently using about one hundred and fifty at any one time for two years of um, work experience. The, the what they need to have um, is the, the time. The enthusiasm and the passion to give on that day, um, day release on a Friday, um, and the legal bit is they've got to have um, 
you know, put, uh, public liability, employer liability, and risk assessments in place um, to make it a, a safe uh, experience. Um, but in terms of what they can offer and share, um, that is the main thing. Um, instead of just brushing the yard under. <laughs> Lydia, yeah, I haven't to... got, yeah, I haven't got too much to add. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, um, we 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 also look for um, employers' liability insurance. Um, but anything that you, if someone approaches you and asks for work experience, even if you think it's only um, for for college programs, a, a few hours a week, um, for some of our students, that will make all the difference to them. Um, and we would like to work with employers to look at what is possible and to work around you. Um, and it's yes, yeah, having the patience and the time to offer the training that's needed for the tasks um, that you want done. Um, but then there's also no obligation to keep that student. So if the student says, "I'm doing it on a college course for a year, I want work experience," and you say, "Okay, right, I'll, I'll have I'll have a go," and after after a month or after a few weeks you think this is not working we as a college we're not going to chase you up about that we will obviously try to explore why it's not worked and see if can, we can put support in place but but there is no obligation so please don't think that you are committing to eight months of you know 16 hours um it's it's anything that you where you are able to offer a young person um hopefully regular um, and a regular opportunity to work on your farm is beneficial for them for the um, for the normal college courses the apprenticeship commitment is very very different um, you are employing that apprentice um, you know full time thanks Lydia right we've run out of time but I'm going to ask one final question um, and I'm going to put that to Lucy it's a twofold question really a um, and this is possibly just of self-interest um, uh, how did the Mel Plash bursary help you? And two, would you choose the same course again in what you know now and what you knew then? Would you do something different? Um, the bursary was uh, fantastically beneficial for me. Um, and I managed to get all the up-to-date John Nix books, which going through university are invaluable. It's a Bible. Um, I managed to buy myself a new laptop um, and a printer, which again, you can't function without one. Um, going to the print room at unearthly hours is just not what you want to do. Having a printer sat in your room is just perfect, and particularly when you get into your own accommodation. Um, so for that, it was just brilliant that I could get those things and keep up to date with the books we were needing to use. Um, in terms of course, I probably would do the same course again um, because I think it was brilliant, covered a lot of topics. But there are so many new courses coming through, um, not just in sort of agriculture, but linking agriculture to food, um, which I think some people are doing at the moment that I know. I, it's a tricky one. Um, I, I enjoyed the course I did and I probably would do it again. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Well, I'm sorry, everybody. We run out of time again. That absolutely shocked by as it always does. So on behalf of everybody who is viewing, can I thank all our panellists in the normal way, uh, Lydia, Andy, David and Lucy. And we look forward to the next um, webinar, which will probably be in the new year. And we're looking into doing something uh, following COP26, which is be rather sort of um, topical. I don't think we're necessarily having an international set of panellists, but we might do, you never know. So thank you very much indeed for watching and thank you again, everybody. Um, for taking part and we look forward to seeing you on the next one thank you thank you and thank you to Melfast show for their bursaries <laughs> thank you thank you all cheerio